Welcome, Your Excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, friends, partners, colleagues, everyone. Uh, welcome to the British Library, uh, where I have the great pleasure of being Chief Executive. And welcome to a little bit of London that is forever Jaipur. There is a sense of intense homecoming as we return, even though virtually, to JLF in London. It's been a huge privilege to partner with the British Library and this collaboration has been so full of joy and learning. It's a particular pleasure for me to come back to the British Library, which has been my office in London for many years, um, and uh, where uh, my books have all been written and researched, and it's very nice to see this end of, uh, of my life sort of double back on it. Our amazing writers, today more than any time, because of the way the digital age has taken over, we need you to be able to make sense of the past, divine the future and perhaps set in context what we're going through at this very point of time. Um, this is the first time I've been to it in London. I've been to the one in Rajasthan before uh, and it's fantastic. Uh, it's got a different vibe here but it's, it's equally wonderful here. Uh, JLF brings this amazing uh, festival to London. It's a wonderful get together of writers and thinkers. And you know, I I, I only go to one festival, literature festival in the world, and it's this one. The people who've been here, both bookshop customers, the authors, and the organisers, have been an absolute delight to work with. I can honestly say as well that this is the best dressed, most elegantly dressed crowd at any literary festival I've ever seen anywhere. It's maintained the, the standards which I'm accustomed to in Jaipur itself and I'm extremely happy to be part of it here. I love this festival. I think it's a privilege for me. JLF deserves enormous congratulation for the way that it puts its program together here. Uh, I think that all of the uh, all of the events are superbly uh, chaired. I think that the setting here in the British Library is uh, is uh, just a, a fantastic uh, environment. Good evening. On behalf of our festival directors, Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple, festival producer Team Vakats and, and the British Library, we welcome you to this session of JLF London at the British Library Virtual Festival, presented in partnership with the Aga Khan Foundation and our patron, the Murthy Family Foundation. Our magazine partner for this series is The Week, journalism with a human touch. Our next session is I Saw Myself, Journeys with Shah Abdul Latif. Shabnam Virmani, introduced by Rita Kothari. The powerful 18th century Sufi poet, Shah Latif, is brought to life with words and music by Shabnam Virmani. We venture into a dream universe of Sindh on a precarious journey into the self. In some moments, leaping off our secure banks into a roaring river in spate, in others, trudging under a harsh desert sun through an unending landscape of loss and in yet others, lifting our faces to receive the gentle caress of a monsoon bursting with love. Shabnam Birmani is a filmmaker, writer and singer. She initiated the Kabir Project Journeys in 2002 and has since been exploring the philosophy of the mystics through a deep engagement with their oral folk traditions. Her inspiration in this poetry has taken the shape of four award-winning films on Kabir, a web archive titled Ajab Sheher, three books, teaching, curations, organizing urban festivals, rural yatras, as well as singing and performing herself. Rita Kothari is a professor of English at the Ashoka University, a distinguished translator, 
Kothari is also a leading theoretician of translation studies and internationally known for books such as Translating India, The Cultural Politics of English, and A Multilingual Nation. Our sessions are available to view on london.glflitfest.org. All our sessions will be available to view on our Facebook page, GLF Lit Fest, and on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest GLF. Do follow our handles, JLF Lit Fest on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified on the upcoming sessions. In case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can log back on london.glflitfest.org or find us on our Facebook and YouTube channels. Please do comment by typing in the comment section. We encourage you to please help keep JLF London at the British Library a free festival by donating generously. And please do support the British Library for all the work for all the work they do by donating. Ladies and gentlemen, I saw myself journeys with Shah Abdul Latif, Shabnam Virmani, introduced by Rita Kothari. Over to you, Rita. Thank you so much, uh, and that was already a wonderful introduction. I think the the eloquence already paved the path for the session we will be doing today with Shabnam of a book that that actually, in some sense, enacts the lyricism, the mysticism, and the openness of Shah Abdul Latif. And considering how Shabnam Birmani has had this lifelong experience of following the paths of mystics, this book also uh, manages to bring us a journey, not a destination, but a journey that we would do well by undertaking together and especially undertaking them in the times that we are living in. Now, who is Shah Abdul Latif and why should we know of him? In 1947, when the province of Sindh went entirely to Pakistan, Acharya Kriplani made a visit to Sindh and he came back and said to Gandhi and others that Sindh is different. I don't see riots there. I don't see people killing each other. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that it is a land of Sufi thought. The word Sufism and Sindh have been quite synonymous with each other. And in that history and in that memory, Shah Abdul Latif is really an iconic presence. Is Shah Abdul Latif a Sufi? Is he a poet? Is he a storyteller? Is he a mystic? I think the English language is uh, has a limited repertoire for us to capture that one word which would classify Shah Abdul Latif for us. At one level, Shah Abdul Latif is very much like Kabir or Mekan Dada from Kutch or Gyaneshwar. But at another level, he's also very tethered to the land of Sindh, of Kutch and of Rajasthan. Shah Abdul Latif travels into what I call the composite West into these regions that were adjacent to each other is evident in the way people would know the stories of Mumal Rano, of Sasoi Puno. People would talk about a lost land like Malir. And it's very common to come across people beginning almost every conversation by saying, Shah Sahib Chayoa, and then go on to give you a bet from the Risalo of Shah Abdul Latif whether it is the betrayal of lovers, or it is the scarcity of rain, or it is the presence of famine, or it is corrupt politicians, from Bunny in Kutch to Barmer in Rajasthan to Karachi and Hyderabad and Jamshoro in Sindh, you will find so many people from such different classes, castes, communities that will quote Shah Sahib. And in some sense, no history of Sufism is complete without some encounter that we need to have with this man who gives us these amazing stories. In some sense, it is Sufism made non-abstract. It is Sufism that is made about love and that is made about relations. So if I were to read out to you something from Kabir who says, Kabir says, the well is one, water bearers many, their pots are of different shapes, but the water in them is one. And then you have Mekan Dada in Kutch who says, I thought the path was one, but there were a thousand million. Whoever took whichever one, 
made it across the ocean. And Shah Abdul Latif says, one palace, one million doors, countless windows in between, from wherever I took the beloved is before me. What is interesting about the project Shabnam takes is that I think it brings together this entire tradition because there has been such a long experience of working with mystics, of translating them, of becoming intimate with them, that her work exemplifies that intimacy. And we are able to see that Shah Abdul Latif forms a part of something that is accessible through the stories he tells. But also there is an ungraspable mysticism about it so that when she calls it, I saw myself, it is almost like when Sasui goes to look for Punu and she says, Punu golinde golinde ma paana Punu thives. I became Punu when I was looking for Punu. In some sense, Piriya ke golinde, in while looking for the beloved, you realize that the Piri is within you. And what is this notion by which the self and the other melt and they diffuse? I think at the times that we are living in, we have, we think of the other as a demonic presence. In fact, as a locus of contagion today, as someone we need to be distancing ourselves from. But what is it to have this other reside in you, to become a part of you, so that there is no Sasui and no Punu who are separate from each other. This is really the joy of mysticism. This is the joy of Sufism. And I think Shabnam Virmani is the most appropriate person introducing us to this joy. So over to you, Shabnam. Wow, thank you so much, Rita, um, for uh, introducing Shah Abdul Latif Bhittai Shah Sai, as he is called in the tradition, with so much uh, uh, richness, clarity, uh, contemporaneousness, and uh, uh, really, I, I thought I would start by saying something about Shah Latif, but I think you've said it all. And I'm going to plunge straight into uh, saying that, you know, when myself and my colleague Vipul Rikhi, with whom this book has been created, we ventured into the oral traditions of Shah Latif uh, in Kutch, uh, Gujarat. What uh, began to unfold for us was the incredible richness and detail with which uh, a land unfolds, you know, the land of Sindh, which is Sindh and is beyond Sindh, in a sense, which is why I like to call it a dream universe of Shah Latif, because it is peopled with so many characters, so many stories, myths, lore, historical events that have been confabulated into the poetry, so much rich detail about the land. Uh, detail about the grasses that grow, the, the, the mountains, the specific mountains, the rivers, so much detail about ordinary people, the rabaris, the cotton spinners, that you, uh, the mind boggles because what you see is uh, an entire rich canvas has been uh, painted or a universe has been spun from the gaze of a poet, one poet. And uh, uh, like you said, uh, I find something, the thing that I find really charming about Shah Abdul Latif Bittai is that uh, he, he, he grounds us in the particular. Uh, there is no um, scorn or disdain as sometimes Nirgun poets like Kabir might have for the material, for the, for the taste of the particular. And a lot of his poetry is just a loving, luxuriant description of people, uh, lands, the weather, the clouds. And from that spell of the sensuous that he, he creates, we get transported into a place beyond the particular. And um, like you said, Shah Abdul Latif exists almost, uh, I think his oeuvre is epic, epic in proportions because also people have made it their own. And even though Shah Abdul Latif's um, oeuvre is, is, is documented reasonably accurately um, in the Ganjay Latif, but uh, it 
has grown as as any tribute to a mystic worth his salt uh, his oeuvre has grown in the oral traditions people have have added to it and and not you know treated it as a fixed uh, letter on page so i I actually struggled when I thought, okay, what do I share with audiences here today in 20, 30 minutes? It's like, which story, which flavor? And it was difficult to choose. So I'm just going to plunge into two flavors of Shah Latif that I want to share with you here today. The first is, uh, comes to us from a story from Junagar. And let me just plunge into the story, okay? Uh, the king of Junagar is a man called Raidiach, a great patron of the arts, a lover of music. One day, sitting in his palace, he hears the strains of a surando come wafting into his palace. And he is intrigued. And he asks his courtiers to go and find out, ye music kahan se hai? Who, where is this coming from? And his courtiers find out that it is a wandering minstrel by the name of Bijal passing by. In a high palace, the king, down on the ground, the bard, but the strains of his surando penetrate the palace walls. The king says, Hazir karo, call him in. So Bijal arrives in the court of uh, the king, and the king says, Bajao. So Bijal begins to play, and as he plays, the king is transfigured. Uh, he is undone by the music. Uh, he is transformed. When the music ends, the king is so moved. He says, ask for anything you want by way of gift, O minstrel, and it shall be yours. And the minstrel looks at him and he says, oh, I don't think you'll be able to afford it, king. King of Junagar swells with pride and says, what? You're telling me I, it, I can't afford it? Ask. Whatever you want, it will be yours. And Bijal says, Nay, nay, rene do. It's okay. Let it be. So the king insists. What is this? Tell me what do you want. And I will say what he wanted in poem. The beggar entered the palace bearing his instrument. He struck up his melody and fortresses fell. O oh, Bijal, your music resounds everywhere. The cry has gone out in the city. You've asked for the king's head. The surando struck a murderous chord. In a flash, the king saw the truth of the bard. Whipping out his dagger, he chopped off his head. This head is worth nothing compared to your voice, your notes. This wretched head doesn't even know how to bow. Yet, it is all I have to give, a humble, paltry gift. This head is not worthy of you. So, um, I think this is the uh, one quality that permeates the Risalo, which is a kind of fierceness about chopping off the head. I mean, this, this image is a very Sufi image. It comes up in Kabir as well, as you know. But it reappears in surah after surah of the uh, Risalo in, in different ways. And here you see it comes to us in, in this amazing story where Bijal gets revealed, the bard, down on the ground, the bard, in the palace, the king, right? But the down on the ground bard is revealed to be the Murshid. The guru who will ask for your head, your khudai, so that you may connect with khuda. And the palace, the fortress itself becomes an image for that proud sense of self that we carry around, right? The ego, the boundaries we build so high and so steep, so fearful. Because if we didn't have fear, why would we need to build such high walls? And it's only the strains of a surando that penetrate those palace walls. So this is another idea in Shalati, which we will not go into, which is the place of music. Uh, but this fierceness of cutting off the head, 
of being able to have that clarity of conviction that what I am guarding is paltry. This sense of self, this my story, my narrative, my nation, my religion, all these my's are actually blocking you from something much vaster that you are capable of. And that recognition that the king has, that this head is not worthy of you, it doesn't even know how to bow. So that fierceness, chop it off. How many of us have that clarity? So Sassi has that clarity. And I will sing a song for you now from uh, another story from the Risalo. Sassi is leaving her friends, her family, and taking off into the Tharpakar, Registan, uh, in search of her beloved Punnu, who has been wrested away from her by angry kinsmen who are objecting to a cross-caste marriage. Familiar old story of divisions. <laughs> So here she says, maybe I'll tell you before I sing. Vekhtho puchhi par kar kahiyar halan ji, aj adesi mar, subha marando sabko. Forget what is past, begin right away. Die today, yogi, tomorrow's too late. So this dying to everything that we cling to, is a fierce call in, in Shah Latif. And here in this song, she's leaving. And she's saying, Shartyo Aita Vinyodi Vinyola, Mujhora Lake Lakhansa. My friends, you be on your way. My destiny is written. I know where my path leads me, which is into the desert with nothing, into the stark nakedness of the desert. Thank you. 
Uh, one quality I wanted to share with you about Shah Latif. Uh, and uh, now the second one is to do with uh, really the role of uh, outer and inner geographies and how the two relate to each other. The outer and inner topographies of the land. And I find it deeply moving how in Shah Latif's uh, dunya, we get drawn into a conversation with the entire cosmos. There is no, no, no aspect, no element of, of the land that is not mobilized into a conversation with Sasi, with Shah Latif. There are conversations with the sun, with the moon, with the wind, with the mountain, uh, with the land. And uh, he sort of, I'll share with you some poems and then, so for instance, uh, about Sassi herself, he says, a blistering wind rose, scorching the whole world. The sky rained sighs. Birds cried out, fluttering on Punhu's trail. Cattle were aghast, shepherds saddened. Animals went into mourning, giving up their breath. The whole desert grieves for Punhu. The setting sun turns red as Sassi sheds tears of blood. There is no wayfarer to whom she can turn. Dazed, perplexed, she walks on. The mountain burst into flames when it brushed against my pain. Oh, friend, the earth was scorched. Trees and shrubs howl in anguish, pausing under their shade. She infected them with her grief. Punu's presence, a dark cloud, a flash of lightning, tears pouring, I walk to him. And in other places in the Ganj, he will say, Pain sprouts like grass, spreading across the land when he departs like a retreating monsoon. Or in another place, don't believe what drops from the sky at dawn is dew. Seeing our suffering, the night is shedding tears. Conversations with the moon. Oak, oh, a cursed moon. Why do you rise so soon? Be off so I can keep my tryst in a pitch black night. Or then, moon, may I be frank, though you may get peeved. Sometimes skinny, sometimes stout, you rise, your face glaring light. Yet, you just can't match the effulgence of my love. And yet again, he will recruit the moon as ally. O oh moon, rise and gaze upon my love. So near to you, so far from me. He dozes softly in the cool night air, perfume wafting from his hair. If I set out on foot, the road would be long. My father won't give me a camel, or I'd be with him before dawn. O oh moon, glow in his courtyard. Touch his feet, speak my thoughts softly to him. And then the arrival of love as the monsoon. Even today, clouds from the north have tumbled and gathered like dark baby tresses hanging low. Lightning appears like a bride in the sky, radiant red. My love was far away. Suddenly, she is near. The sun peeps cautiously, obscured by clouds. Lightning shouts, congratulations, I bring news of rain. O oh, heart, hold steady, 
your love will soon be here. Clouds don't delight as much as a glimpse of my love without her. The season is empty and so is my heart. But look, here she comes, like a thousand gusty monsoons, filling me to the brim. So, what is Shah Latif doing here? I think maybe it's our particular historical moment of modernity and perhaps urbanity and our deep, deep alienation from the natural world, uh, especially in the times of the pandemic and global ecological crisis. We feel it even more piquantly, don't we? Our disaffection, our deep, deep disconnect from the natural world. And it's so moving in Shah Latif's dunya to develop a kinship with, with the moon, with the wind, to converse with them, to get emotionally tangled up with them, to learn from the elements, to recognize the self in them. You see, because it's all, the mountain is, is, a, is an inner block that you need to cross over. Uh, the river is the Bhavsagar, it's the, the torrents of life, ever-changing, never stopping, that you need to wade through. So these are uh, how the natural world mirrors within uh, and how when you see yourself in the natural world and learn from it, learn impermanence from it, change from it, detachment from it, learn love from it, learn to be in rhythm from it, uh, how you feel anchored how much solace there is in that. So that's the other mood and flavor I wanted to share. And uh, now I will just end quickly because I think I'm running out of time with uh, a song from Sohini. <laughs>
Shabnam Virmani. Thank you so much, Shabnam, for those beautiful words and the songs. We would also like to thank Rita Kotari for introducing you before the session. We will now take questions from the audience. We have time only for a few, so I will do my best to group them together and ask you, Shabnam. Sure. Uh, the first question is from Komal, and she asks, films such as those of the Kabir project and Tu Zinda Hai, depict the stories of people who do not uh, who do not fit the mold of societal constructs who forge new paths and merge together previously polarized concepts how does one approach portraying such individuals are you ever concerned that their revolutionary nature might prompt shock or outrage from audiences uh hardly i i would say that's the whole purpose of this poetry um uh, if we don't shock, if we don't uh, uh, bonk people on the head with uh, the Shabd Ki Chot, as it is called in the tradition of Kabir, which is the wound of the word, then what's the whole point of, uh, of this? Uh, so I'm never concerned. In fact, I would be concerned if everybody is a little too happy. Uh, you know, uh, I remember when... Uh, one of the Kabir films faced some violence as well uh, after a screening and there was a lot of concern and uh, when we showed it in Gujarat, people panned the film in one particular screening. Um, I remember Prahlad Tepanyaji with whom I was traveling said, well, you've made a film on Kabir. Surely somebody should be upset, right? Otherwise, it's not doing its purpose. Uh, so, uh, I think in fact, often the, the opposite is the danger that, you see, uh, it's a very interesting tension and pull and pull, pull and push uh, between the revolutionary or the iconoclastic vision of these poets, uh, which makes people uncomfortable, the orthodox uncomfortable. And also in that vision is incredibly healing um, a sort of a vision that gives you a great sense of uh, oneness. Uh, and unless you connect the two, uh, you can float off into your little elevated space and not relate with the iconoclasm of these poets. So I feel, in fact, the opposite is a greater danger, which is that we, we sort of uh, make this poetry into a kind of feel-good space, and we don't make the connect between the poetry and the politics of our lives. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Vinita Reddy also wants to ask you a question and she says, you participated as, as one of the cast of the 
2013 film Scattered Windows Connected Doors. Uh-huh. What do you feel uh, this project allowed you to express to the world? Well, that's uh, I actually don't even remember uh, that film that well. I would need to go and look at it again. But I think what I remember feeling was uh, a sense of kinship and solidarity with many other women who are charting interesting journeys in their personal lives and to see my story interpellated or collated with them uh, gave, gave me a great sense of location, I think, uh, a location in a kind of a um, historical moment, if you will, where women are, uh, you know, bucking, bucking the trends, pushing the envelope, doing, doing things that uh, surprise. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And now Sonal asks, which I think this sh- would be the last question because we just have two and a half minutes left. Sure. Sonal's question to you is, your career inspires both individualism and expression. What advice or experience would you share with young aspiring storytellers who wish to follow in your footsteps? Uh, that's an interesting question. Actually, uh, I think uh, what I found uh, by participating in the oral traditions through my work uh, as a filmmaker or singer, writer, is uh, both a sense of individualism and capacity for individual expression, and very importantly, a sense of being anchored and located in a tradition that predates me by hundreds of years and is a stream in which many people have participated. So actually in really important moments in my journey, I I have sort of recognized that the problem in fact is too much individual uh, need for individual expression. Uh, I think especially it's the burden of modernity, this burden we bear of having to be original, having to have our stamp and signature on things we offer the world. Um, I think uh, we need to learn a little bit from the oral traditions and rest easy in belonging to traditions that are vaster than us. And actually, often what we need to as artists realize that there is something that's trying to express itself through you. You need to get out of the way. So that would be my, my advice to to young artists, just get out of the way, you know, with your particular, often self-important artistic ego about what you are doing. Uh, you know, just blend, blend, connect. Something will flow through you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shabnam. For, on behalf of all our colleagues from JLF and Teamwork Arts, thank you for being part of the JLF London family. Uh, thank you. Thank I, you want to, I want to... I want to... Arts and our souls. Thank you. I just want to say thanks to my student uh, and friend Swagat Shivakumar for singing that last song with me. He wasn't introduced. And I want to thank JLF as always for and Teamworks and all of you for being such great uh, partners in, in these cultural journeys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for making our festival successful. Thank you for taking the time out. My pleasure. Thank you and thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. We thank our partners, the Aga Khan Foundation and our patron, the Murthy Family Foundation for their support. Our next session that will begin shortly is The Wall. John Lanchester in conversation with Akash Kapoor. And now we present a reading from the JLF Writer Shot series presented by Carol Haley from the University of Swansea. Hi, I'm Carol Haley and earlier this year I completed my PhD in creative writing at Swansea University. I'm going to read you the prologue from my novel, which is called Rain. There is a hill. 600 million years ago, the fires of a supervolcano fling minerals into the sky. Feldspar and pyroxene and olivine, augite and magnetite and ilmenite fall back to earth 
sinking through oceans to the deep, dark places where rocks are made. For an unimaginable time, the rocks drift across the surface of the earth until 60 million years ago, a cataclysmic rift heaves them from the sea and the hill is made. For the longest time, the hill has no name because there are no people to give it a name. Weather batters it, softening its sharp peaks and rivers cut through it, sculpting clefts, ridges and valleys. Again and again the air grows cold and the hill is scraped clean by glaciers until finally, 10,000 years ago, the ice retreats and does not return. Life flourishes, rain seeps deep into the earth, springs rise and a stream slips down the hill. Seeds scatter on the wind and trees and grasses grow. The unnamed hill is one of many, nubs of a spine dividing sea from pasture. 5,000 years ago, people arrive at the foot of the hill. They climb to the top and know that this is the place they have been searching for. Somehow they push and pull and roll huge stones to the top of the hill and raise them in a circle. These people give the hill a name and they hold the name close so no one but them will know it. They use the stone circle for sacred ceremonies and the hill is as precious to them as the stones they have raised upon it. 2,000 years ago, different people come to the hill. These people have tools for shaping iron. They admire the sheltered valley below the hill. The grass is lush for their animals and the earth is fertile so their crops grow tall and plump. They settle near a bend in the river. They are watched by the birds wheeling far above them and the people see them and call their home Bird Valley. These people don't know why there is a circle of stones on the top of the hill, so they make up stories about it. Some of them see gods inside the circle. <laughs>